In the last lecture we covered the basic operations of matrices. In this lecture and the next, we'll look at three different ways we can solve systems of equations using matrix algebra. In this module we'll start first with how we can use matrix notation to represent a system of simultaneous equations. Then we'll see how we can solve a system of equations using Gaussian elimination. In module 2 we'll introduce the concept of the inverse of the matrix. We'll develop one method of finding the inverse, again using Gaussian elimination. In module 3 we'll cover some concepts that will be used in lecture 12, namely determinants, minors and cofactors. Determinants tell us whether a matrix has an inverse or not. So we have a system of two equations with two variables, x and y. The coefficients are a, b, c and d. p and q are the right-hand side constants. Recalling matrix multiplication from the last lecture, we can see that the left-hand side can be written as a product of two matrices, a 2 by 2 and a 2 by 1 the right-hand side becomes a 2 by 1 matrix, or a column vector. In matrix notation, we have this. We have a square matrix of coefficients, a vector of variables, and a vector of constants. The matrix of coefficients will always be a square matrix, as we need to have the same number of equations as there are variables. Here's another example where the coefficients are numbers. Convert that into matrix notation. Note that where we have a variable missing from the equation, in this case x2 here, that's the same as having a zero coefficient in the matrix of coefficients. We formulate systems of equations in matrix notation because it makes it easier to solve them. There are a number of ways of doing this. The method we'll consider here is Gaussian elimination. In this module, we'll solve a system of equations first using Gaussian elimination without using matrix notation, and then we'll repeat the exercise using matrices. We've already come across Gaussian elimination. Recall solving a system of two equations by elimination in lecture two. That's what we did there. To start with, we specify three elementary row operations that will leave the solution to the set of equations unchanged. In other words, we can form any combination of these operations and still have a logical equivalent set of equations. We can interchange any pair of equations. Later, we'll think about them as rows. Just changing the order of the equations won't change the solution. We can multiply an equation by a scalar. We've already come across this in solving single equations. The third operation might be less familiar, but once again we've already come across it in the simple case of solving by elimination. This rule tells us we can add any multiple of one equation to a different equation. We use combinations of these operations to solve the equations. Let's work through an example. As I mentioned, first we'll solve the equations as equations. We would not normally do this. We'd go straight to matrix notation. However, I want you to see that the operations we perform under matrix notation are exactly the same as the ones we perform on the equations themselves. Here we have a set of three equations and we want to solve for x, y and z. First we'll formulate the problem in matrix notation. We can convert the left-hand side and the right-hand side to a pair of column vectors. On the left we have a 3 by 1 vector, and also on the right. On the left we can see that's the product of a 3 by 3 and a 3 by 1. The square matrix is the matrix of coefficients, and the 3 by 1 vector is the vector of the variables. So there we have our system of equations in matrix notation. We'll come back to that later. For now, let's solve for x, y and z using the equations. Recall we're going to be using elementary row operations and we want to get the equations into the following form. In the first equation we want x to have a coefficient of 1, so it'll be 1x plus ay plus bz is equal to f. In the second equation we want a 0 coefficient for x and a 1 coefficient for y and some value for z. And in the third equation, we want a coefficient of 1 for z. Of course then, z equals h, and we do our backward substitution to find values for y and x. We start with our equations. Our first step is to get a coefficient of 1 for the x in the first equation. We have a coefficient of 1 for x in the second equation. We also have a coefficient of 0 
for x in the first equation. As we'll see, that'll come in handy. So our first operation then is to swap rows 1 and 2. Row 3 remains unchanged. Now we have the 1 we wanted as coefficient for x in the first equation. In this case, we also have a 0 coefficient for x in the second equation. Now we can move on to the third equation. We want to perform an operation that gives us a 0 for the coefficient for x. Well, if we add 3 times equation 1 to equation 3, we'll get that result. We'll have new row 3 is equal to row 3 plus 3 times row 1. So equations 1 and 2 remain unchanged. We add 3 times equation 1 to equation 3. So minus 3x plus 3x will give us 0x. Plus 2y plus 3y will give us 5y. Plus 2z plus 9z, 3 times 3z, will give us plus 11z. And we mustn't forget the right-hand side. We'll have minus 10 plus 3 times 2, 6, give us minus 4. Now we have the x's sorted out. Let's look at the y's. Our next operation will be to get a coefficient of 1 for y in the second equation. We'll do that by dividing an equation 2 by 2. New row 2 is equal to row 2 divided by 2. Equations 1 and 3 remain unchanged. And we divide equation 2 by 2. So we'll have y minus, well, 1 half z is equal to minus 7 on 2. Our next step is to get a 0 for the coefficient of y in the third equation. So we'll subtract 5 times equation 2 from equation 3. New row 3 is equal to row 3 minus 5 times row 2. Equations 1 and 2 remain unchanged. We have 5y minus 5y gives us 0y. We have 11z minus 5 times, well, minus a half z. So we'll be adding 5 on 2 times z to 11z. So we add 5 on 2 times z to 11z. That will give us 27 on 2 times z. It's equal to, on the right-hand side, we have minus 4 minus 5 times minus 7 on 2. Well, that'll also give us plus 27 on 2. And a final step then is to get a 1 as a coefficient for the z in the third equation. We'll get that by multiplying equation 3 by 2 on 27. Equations 1 and 2 are the same. For equation 3, we'll have z equals 1. So we've solved for z. What we do now is use backward substitution to solve for y and x. From equation 2, we have y minus 1 half z is equal to minus 7 on 2. We know z, so y minus 1 half times 1 is equal to minus 7 on 2. Adding 1 half to both sides gives us y equals minus 3. We substitute into equation 1 to solve for x. Equation 1 so will have x plus minus 3 plus 3 times 1 is equal to 2. That implies that x is equal to 2. Our solution then is that x, y, z is equal to 2 minus 3, 1. As I mentioned earlier, this is the only time we'll solve using the actual equations. We'll see that it's more efficient to use matrix notation. I'm sure you'll agree that there's a more efficient way of working through that process. The essential parts of the problem are the coefficients of the variables and the right-hand side constants. We've seen how they can be represented using matrix notation. What we do now is to combine them in what's called an augmented matrix. This is our augmented matrix in general terms, more specifically for a 3x3. Three three. This is what it looks like. On the left we have the matrix of coefficients, and on the right the vector of constants. They're divided by a vertical line. We now perform the elementary row operations on the augmented matrix. We start with position A11. And we want to convert that into a 1, so that's the coefficient for the x in the first equation. After that, we work down through column 1. We convert these to zeros, again using row operations. 
Next we go to A22 and convert that into a 1 and then down column 2 so that we get a 0 in the A32 position and finally we convert the A33 position into a 1. Of course the right hand side values are also transformed so what we're left with then is that Z is equal to whatever value is in the B31 position. We then perform backward substitution to get the values of X and Y. Here we can see the final form that we want the augmented matrix to be in. We perform the elementary row operations until we have what's called an upper triangular matrix with ones along the principal diagonal and zeros below the diagonal. This is what's called the row echelon form of the augmented matrix. If we stop at this point, we use backward substitution to obtain values of X and Y. Another approach is to keep on doing the elementary row operations until we have what's known as the reduced row echelon form, where we have the principal diagonal, again, is 1s, but all the off-diagonal elements are zeros. In this case, the right-hand side of the augmented matrix are the actual solutions for X, Y and Z. Now let's go back to example 1 and see how we can solve the problem more efficiently using an augmented matrix rather than the full equations. In example 2 we have the same system of equations as we had in example 1. We saw how to convert the system of equations into the matrix format. What we'll do here is to formulate the augmented matrix. On the left we have A, the matrix of coefficients, and on the right the matrix or column vector of constants. Note that we separate these two with our vertical line. Do we have our augmented matrix? What we want to do is to get a 1 in the A11 position. We have a 1 in the A21 position. So the easiest thing to do is to swap rows 1 and 2. That gives us the 1 where we want it. It also gives us a 0 in the A21 position. What we could do next and what we did with the equations was go down to the A31 position and convert that to a zero. The other thing we could do is to move to the right and convert the A22 position to a one. This is really the only choice you have in this process. Let's do that. We'll convert the A22 position into a one by dividing row two by two. Now we want to convert the A31 position into a one. We do that first using the one in the first row there's a systematic approach to these row operations and it's important to follow the order otherwise you'll end up doing more operations than necessary. We'll convert the minus 3 into a 0 by adding 3 times row 1. So now our step is to convert this 5 into a 0. We'll do that by subtracting 5 times row 2. We can see that the 3 1 position won't be affected because the 2 1 position is already a zero. So subtract five times row two. That leaves us with the A33 position. We want to convert that into a one. We do that by multiplying row three by two on 27. We could stop the elimination process here and use the backward substitution as we did before. However, let's go on until we have the reduced row echelon form. What we do next is to convert that minus a half into a zero. We do that by adding one half row three to row two. Now we just need to get zeros in the one two position and the one three position. The order is not so important here. We'll convert the one two position into a zero by subtracting row two from row one. And finally we subtract three times row three from row one. So here we have the reduced row echelon form. We have an identity matrix on the left hand side and here we have the solutions for X, Y and Z that we found earlier. Let's recap on what we've done. We start out with our system equations. We have them here in matrix form. We carried out the elementary row operations until we converted the matrix of coefficients into an identity matrix. If we multiply the matrix of variables by the identity matrix, then we're left with the matrix of variables. So we have the vector x, y, z 
is equal to the vector 2 minus 3, 1, our solution.